All right, this one looks a little bit nastier, but we can probably handle it. No, no, we can definitely handle it. Um, let's see what we can do here. We need to know R. We find it in our premises, right? Here's R. Now, it's stuck in a parentheses that's part of even a longer statement. That's the only R we have on the board. So we can kind of look and say, well, you know what? This is an AND, right? So we can simplify out half the AND. I'm going to R or W. How could we get R by itself? If we knew that W was false, then we could use disjunctive syllogism to conclude the other half of this disjunctive statement, R. So we're going to have to show that uh, W is false. Well, here's another W. We don't know from this that it's false. But modus tollens, if we can show that this is false, then we can conclude that that is false, right? So we need to show that not T is false or if you would rather, that T is true. Well, here's another T, and it's part of an AND statement, so we can simplify it out. Uh, in order to prove that T is true, we would have to know that S is true. And that would be modus ponens, right? And so we do, in line three, know that S is true, so we're ready to begin. I hope you followed some of that. If not, just go watch it again. Um, the point is that I'm looking for the conclusion and, and kind of seeing what I'll have to do to get it by itself. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it means I at least have an idea of where I need to go. So the first thing I'm going to do is simplify out this if s then t. That's from line one, simplification. It's in the middle of an and statement. And I know that the rule for simplification says p and q, but remember we're just dealing with dominant operators here. And that rule p and q, uh, p and q are just placeholders that go around that and. Here's our and, this is like P, this is like Q. So we just simplified out the first half. That's all we've done, nothing very interesting really yet. And we know that one of the things we said we were going to have to do is use modus tollens to prove that, or I'm sorry, modus ponens to prove that T is true. So here we have if S and T and S, or if you are following the rules, this is like if P then Q, P, so we can conclude Q. Well here Q is T. I just mean the consequence of this if that statement, right? Just like in the rule. So we can do that from lines three and four. Modus ponens. I know you thought you were done with modus ponens 7.1 is a thing of the past and all that, but the rules don't go away. So now we know T is true. What Hurley will require you to do, you and I both know that if T is true, not T is false, so by modus ponens, we should be able to conclude that W is false. Hurley won't let us do that, because he's a jerk. And so what we're going to have to do instead is use one of the dumb rules, dumb negation, to change this T to a not, not T. Because this says, if you did it like this, which you can, you don't have to, but you can. Uh, this consequent here, not T, is false. So now set us up for modus tollens. And we use that double negation rule. Next on the list, I suppose we can go ahead and do our modus tollens and conclude that W is false by lines two and six, right? Because six tells us that the consequence of two is false. Two, six, modus tollens. We're getting there, we're getting there. We're actually really only one step away if we didn't have to use all these weird rules in the meantime. But Hurley is going to require us to switch these so that we can simplify out. We already simplified out of S and T. In order to simplify this out, we're going to have to put it out front because that's what Hurley makes us do. And that comes from oops, line one. That's commutativity or association? That is commutativity. Okay, so now we can simplify out this R or W. And we'll do that, that'll become line nine. From eight, we simplify. Can you see that? Yeah, it's pretty close. Okay. 
Now we have what we need, right? We know R or W. Earlier on, we figured out that uh, W is false. And so if W is false, R is on its left. So I'm going to say line 10 is R. From lines 9 and 7, I'll call it 7 and 9, disjunctive syllogism. Now, for the record, I'm not really sure where Early is on this one. Uh, will he make us switch this and put W first because that's what's negated here? Maybe. And if so, that's okay. It's one additional line. We put an additional line here, and it's just another commutativity. All we're taking doing is switching this around. I'm not sure where how aptly it handles situations like that. It would not be wrong to do, but in my view, it's not really necessary. So there we go. We got to our conclusion. R. Uh, it wasn't a lot of fun, perhaps, but we got there eventually.